Let us bow our head for a word of prayer, then we're going to go to the word of God and allow God to speak. Holy Spirit, you're wonderful. Holy Spirit, you're gracious. Holy Spirit, you're kind. On this resurrection Sunday morning, where the world has set aside some time to just reflect on the fact that the grave couldn't keep you in and the fact that you emerged from that grave victorious. As we go to your word, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear, to receive, most of all to be in tune, um, and to understand even more the benefits of what we celebrate as a church, what we celebrate as a just a community of believers, as those who profess you as Lord and Savior, God, bring clarity to that, to us, Lord. Felix moves out of the way because it's never about me, it's all about you. Um, if you don't speak, there really is nothing to say, so I pray that you would bring to remembrance that which has been inputted and deposited. Lord, let something be said that would help somebody who came to meet you this morning, someone who came to encounter you, someone who came because they needed a word from you. So Holy Spirit, I move out, out of the way. And I invite you just to enthrone my life. Sit on the throne, God, and you move and have your way, God. In your name, we pray and thank you. Amen and amen. Do me a favor and turn to your neighbor real quick and say, neighbor, whatever you do, you need to know that Jesus is alive. So stop looking for life in the graveyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, tell your other neighbor. Yeah, come on. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, yeah. Tell your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. Other neighbor. Whatever, you do, Whatever you do, know that Jesus is alive. Know that Jesus is alive. So, stop so stop looking for life in the graveyard. In the graveyard. Amen. Amen. You, now listen, listen. Tell them like you know their business. Just say, come out the graveyard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amen. Allow God to just move. Amen. As we go to God's Word this morning, um, I just want to begin by letting you know letting go of the past is something that most of us struggle with. Yes. Come on, can we be honest this morning? Letting go of yesteryear is something that we wrestle with, is something that we struggle with. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's been past hurts, past pains, maybe it's the loss of a job that you love, or a marriage, or a relationship, whatever the loss may be. It causes great pains in our life, and that becomes very, very difficult to just release and to let go and to move on, and the result is we spend an enormous amount of time living in our past, living in yesterday, in places where things have died and move on, and we have a hard time moving on because the past could be so painful at times. Come on, does anybody agree with me this morning? My mother, my mother died when I was eight years old as a young man. Um, very, very young in age, I lost my mom. And the striking thing that, 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 that hit me about the death of my mom is at the time I was attending Catholic school, and she was buried in a Catholic graveyard. And back then, we didn't have Ubers, and we didn't have, you know, some of the things that we have. And so what we would have to do was walk to school. Y'all don't know nothing about that. Yeah, <laughs> nothing about that, yeah. We'd have to walk to school. And interestingly enough, on the way home, the graveyard where my mother was buried was in direct path on the way home. And what I would do is every single day, I would beeline through that graveyard and walk through that graveyard on my way home. Then when I would get to mom's grave, I would spend some time at mom's grave because it's challenging and it was difficult for me to release that. Come on, are you hearing me? The same, the same is true as I got older in life, my father... Um, was just evilly murdered, um, you know, I was 38 years old, and I got a call saying, hey, Felix, your dad is dead, get down to the islands as fast as you could, and I made my way down there, and then my dad was buried in a graveyard, and it's interestingly enough, every time, I mean, I do this today, every time I take a trip to the, to the Virgin Islands, I will visit my dad's grave and sit there and speak to him because why? My dad and I did not have the best relationship. And in the latter years of his life, he would, we were working hard to restore and to rebuild that relationship. And he was suddenly taken away from me. So I spent a lot of time. I spent a lot of time at that graveyard because of the pain of the past, the wounds that that has caused, and how difficult it is to release that. 
And I think there's people here that have stories that are similar to mine. Come on, can I get a witness? I mean, it might not be a parent, it might not be, you know, your mom or dad, but maybe something, some challenging situation in your life that has just has you in shock and it makes it difficult to let go of that. But I stopped by just long enough to let you know that I've got good news this morning. And the good news is Jesus is alive. Come on, y'all. He's alive. Yeah, he's alive. And because, and because he is alive, we can stop. We can. We really can. We can stop living life in the graveyards of our past. As you look at this text in the book of Luke that we're going to read in a little while, let me just give you a little bit of literary context. Approximately seven days prior to the time of the text, and if you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus, who was just crucified and raised from the dead, he was hailed as king of the Jews. And here's what's striking about him being hailed as king of the Jews. He had just made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And in that exposition, as he made his entry into Jerusalem, we saw last week that people laid their coats on the floor and they cut palm branches as a way of spreading out a red carpet for him to make his entrance into Jerusalem. What was celebrated about that is that the very people that were celebrating had expectation that he would overthrow the Roman government and he would set up the Jewish empires and the people of God, uh, specifically the Jewish nation, would once again set themselves up as world dominance and have preeminence in the earth. But when Jesus made it into Rome and they find out that he didn't come to set up a physical and a literal kingdom, the very people who were singing his praise turned around and crucified him. Come on, y'all know the story. The very people, the very people that were there to celebrate him turn around and crucified him. What's striking about the text that we're about to see is that it's been three days now since he had been crucified. And if you know anything about biblical literature, the grave can't keep in him because he had prophesied that you tear this temple down, I will rebuild it again in three days. But the shocking thing about the story that we're about to look at is that as we get to the text now, the Sabbath had passed. And prior to the Sabbath, he went through all the things that he went through being persecuted, marched from Judgment Hall to Judgment Hall. And they finally crucified him, placed him in that grave, and rolled the stone in front of him. We'll talk about that a little while. And now the Sabbath has passed, and his inner circle, I call them the Women's Missionary Society, they're, amen, amen, because those, those, those are some committed people. They make their way to the graveyard to anoint Jesus. And I want to pick the story up there. And so go with me to Luke chapter 24. Let's read. We're going to talk through this, and then I want to share some things with you. So if you're in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, say amen if you're there. Amen. Let me read this in its entirety, then I'll give you a little more context, and we'll just talk about the three brief things that I want to share with you. It says here now, but on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, being those missionary society, those women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man would be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified on the third day. Uh, and then on the third day, rise. And they remembered, verse 8 says, his word. Come on, say they remembered his word. I wish I had time to really give you some more context, but when you look at the synoptics and what the synoptics are, it's a combination of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's rendition of this particular narrative. When you read Matthew's version, here's what Matthew says about this very passage. Matthew says that after Jesus had died, the Pharisees, that's the religious leaders, those are the church people, they held a meeting with Pilate because they were the ones that were guilty of crucifying him. 
They held a private meeting with Pilate. This is Matthew's rendition. And they said to Pilate, let me quote, this imposter, referring to Jesus, had made mention that on the third day he would rise from the grave. So here's what the church folk said to Pilate. To guarantee that he, he's not raised from the grave, or to guarantee that at least his disciples don't go and steal his body and create some uproar saying that he has been resurrected, why don't you go post some guards at the tomb to make sure that he stays in there? This is Matthew's rendition. And then when you get to Matthew chapter 28, around the first part of that chapter, Matthew continues his story right after. And Pilate says to them, go ahead and do what you got to do. Now, I find that striking because these are the, the Pharisees, and it's during the Sabbath. It seems that they're violating the Sabbath to keep Jesus in the grave. I hope you hear what I'm saying here, right? And then listen to how 28 opens up, right? 28 opens up that they had this plan to keep Jesus in the grave, but God himself had other plans, right? So here's how it says, immediately following the Sabbath, God then releases an angel to come down to the earth and to cause this great earthquake and then the angel rolls the stone away from the front of the grave. I'm going to talk about that in a little while. And, and Jesus emerges with all power. And the people that were guarding the tomb were so shocked that they fell there. They fell, I mean, they just fainted at the sight of what God was doing. And God opened the door and paved the way for Jesus to come out. Now, my problem with the text is not Matthew's rendition. It's not... Mark's rendition is not John's rendition. My problem with the text is the Women's Missionary Society. That's my problem with the text. Because that's where I see me, and that's where I see you. These were people who had walked with Jesus. I wish I had somebody. In here. These were people who had spent might I risk it to say a minimum of, or maybe a maximum of three years with him as he walked the face of the earth? These were people that were present at every revival service that he conducted. These were people that witnessed him raising the dead. These were people that witnessed him feeding the 5,000. Come on, y'all not hearing me. These were people that witnessed him opening up blinded eyes. And these were people that saw him making the lame walk. And these were people that ate with him, that lived life with him. If there were anyone that should have believed what he said, it should have been. That's my problem with the text because when I see them, I see me. And I see you because I know how long I've been walking with Jesus and I know how long some of y'all have been walking with Jesus. But yet and still, we've witnessed his miracles. Come on, we've witnessed his hand. We've witnessed his blessings. We've witnessed the miraculous. But we act just like these women do. And we don't believe that Jesus will do what he said he's going to do. So when I look at the text, I see three reasons why these women went back and looked for life in the graveyard. And I think those reasons are transferable directly to me, and I think they're transferable directly to you. Come on, come on, repeat your turn here and say, neighbor, he's talking about you, and he's talking about himself. So put the first slide on the screen. I want to walk through this and... Show you the extent of the text, and I won't be long before you. The first reason I want to place the argument that these women look for life in the graveyard is because they had what I'm going to refer to as unfinished business. Come on, say unfinished business. Unfinished. One more time, say unfinished business. unfinished. Let's look at the text. Look at the text. If you notice with me in verse 1, it says, First day of the week... At early dawn, they went to the tomb, and notice what the text says. My, my translation says, taking the spices they had prepared. 
Now let me tell you what's important about that phrase, that verbal phrase, taking the spices they had prepared, is that if you were to back up to chapter 23 and look around verse, um, verse 50, or what verse is that? Yeah, about verse 54, we see Joseph of Arimathea taking Jesus' body down and wrapping it in a linen and placing it within a borrowed tomb. And then we notice that in verse 54, look at what verse 54 says, it was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath, the text says, was just beginning. And the women who had come with him from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid, and notice what they did around the timing of the day of preparation. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments, and notice what they did next, and they rested, uh, on the Sabbath they rested according to the command. Then 24 picks up. When the Sabbath was over, on the first day of the early in the dawn, they went to the tomb to handle the business they had not finished. <laughs> Come on, say they had prepared. Here's what that word prepared meant, is that they had made res ready. They had done some work beforehand, and they fully expected that what they had done, they should have delivered to Jesus. Now, y'all stay with me. Don't mind the fact that they should have known, I'm going to get to that. I want to hang on to the issue of unfinished business. And because they did not get a chance to go anoint Jesus' body, and what you need to know about that is that the Jewish tradition was they didn't uh, allow embalming of a corpse. And so what these women were doing is that they prepared ointment so that as the body was decaying, they could anoint the body and they could prevent the stench of the decomposition of with the corpse, the corpse. But the point that I'm trying to make is, is that before Jesus got in that grave, they placed him in there. They saw where he had been buried, and then they went back on the day of preparation, which was the day before the Sabbath. And what the day of preparation is, it's the day you go grocery shopping. It's the day you put oil in your lamp. Come on. It's the day you barbecue like some of y'all did last night in preparation for this afternoon. Come on, are you with me? It's the day you make everything ready because when Sabbath came, no work was allowed. So now watch this. They made preparation, and then when they went back, they were fully expecting to serve Jesus' body with what they had prepared. And the thing that took them back to the tomb was the fact that in their mind, they had unfinished business. Listen, y'all. The reason I go back to the graveyard, let me, let me use myself as an illustration before you think I'm meddling. My mom, when I was eight years old, contracted a stroke. And I was at school doing my school lesson, and when I came home, I'm looking for mom all over the house, right? Then the last thing I heard is your mother is in the hospital. Now, I go to the hospital. She's in a stroke. She can't talk. She can't look at me. So listen to this. In my mind, I have unfinished business. Because I never got a chance to tell mom I love her. I never got a chance to say goodbye. Y'all not hearing me. Come on. So the reason I go to the graveyard is I'm hoping for a conversation. I wish somebody was here. I'm hoping for, listen to the word, closure because I have unfinished business. It's no different than my dad. Here I am leading a church in Colorado, and I get word that your father was murdered. Once again, I, may, I beeline down to the islands. I get there, and my dad is dead, and we were just mending our relationship. So here's what that said to me. Once again, no closure. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. I didn't get a chance to talk. So here's what happened. Every single time, I kid you not, Katani will tell you, to date, whenever we go to the islands, we get off that plane, we unpack our stuff, and there's two grave sites I need to visit. And as old as I am, I will get to those grave sites and I will cry every single time because I have unfinished business. There is no closure. And listen to this. The unfinished business takes me back to the graveyard. Maybe you think I'm talking about me. 
The reason you drive by his house after you've been divorced for 10 years, come on, is because you've got, yeah, you get it, yeah. You get it now. You've got unfinished business. Come on. The reason you can't stand those kids of his that walk by, why? It's because you too have unfinished business. The reason you can't let go is because they got the last word and you didn't get the last word in. And every time you see them, you just want to give them a piece of you. I wish I had somebody because you had prepared some things. You had prepared some things that you were going to do, and when you got there, you didn't get a chance to do you. And so unfinished business. Come on, y'all. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. Y'all wake up at night. Talking about, mm. In your sleep. Come on. Unfinished business. And we are tempted more times than often to go back to the graveyard. Are you hearing me? Because we have some unfinished things. Listen to me. I'm going to get ahead of myself. But I need you to know that Jesus died to take care of unfinished business. And he rose from the grave to free us. I wish I had somebody. I wish I had somebody in here. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, it's Resurrection Sunday. Let it go. Come on, tell the other neighbor, say, let it go. go. Unfinished business will press you to the graveyard every single time. Come on. Where the scripture says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But man, we see some corpse of our past walking around. And guess where we go right away in our mind? Straight to the graveyard. Unfinished business will do that. Put the second slide on the screen. Here's the second thing I want you to see that drew these women back to the graveyard. The second thing that drew them back was they refused to accept the truth of their situation. They refused to accept the truth of their situation. Look with me at verse 2. When they got there, they found a stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, They did not find the body of the Lord. And while they were perplexed about this, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. And the man said to them, I love this. Why are you looking or seeking the living among the dead? I I wish I had a tomb to really illustrate this. They walked in the tomb, and mind you, mind you, in case you're, you're processing, the stone was not rolled away to let Jesus out. Don't make that mistake. I mean, you do know he could have walked. <laughs> and you also know he didn't need no angel to roll nothing. So check this out. It was rolled away to let them in as opposed to letting them out. And and this this strengthens my second point, because here they are, they get there, and they're looking at the data in front of them. Y'all not hearing me. They're looking at the empty tomb. Matter of fact, they see two angels sitting on the tomb, and they're looking at the fact that the shroud is rolled up, and even though they're seeing with their very own eyes that Jesus is not there, they refuse to accept the truth of their situation. Now, why is it, preacher, are you saying that they refuse to accept the truth of their situation? Look at number A, because as close to Jesus as these women were, they had a faulty perception of who he was. They didn't sign up for a Messiah that couldn't overthrow Rome. Come on, y'all. They didn't sign up for a Messiah who the grave was going to kill. Y'all not hearing me. They didn't sign up for a Messiah who couldn't do what they thought he should have done. And because he, he flipped the script on them and he came humbly and he died to deliver them, they could not accept the truth of what they were seeing. Don't miss this. Watch the second thing. And because of their perception of who Jesus was, it caused them to miss the message. 
faulty perception, and because of the faulty perception, Jesus is communicating the whole time, and it causes them to miss the message. People, here's what draws us to the graveyard. I'm not going to stay here long because I'm going to get in trouble for this. Girl, I love you. Girl, you're the best thing I've ever seen. I'm going to buy you a house. I'm going to marry you. I'm going to be the best whatever. And the whole time, he got 50 other people that he's telling the same thing. You've developed a perception of who he is. Y'all not hearing me. Y'all, y'all don't hear me. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? You've developed a perception of what he should do. You develop a perception, he or she, come on, I don't just want to pick on the ladies, but men just as well. Come on, are you with me? We develop a perception of what they shouldn't do. And then when it doesn't happen, even though we see him with her or her with him, we refuse to accept the truth of the situation. Y'all not hearing me. Come on, yeah. Come on, y'all. Don't act like it doesn't happen. We refuse to accept the truth and listen to what it does. It draws us to the graveyard and have us looking for life in places we ought not be looking. Are you hearing me? And then here's what the striking thing. It's not like we don't see the truth, but we're so blinded by what we want, we miss what's being communicated the whole time. The whole time. It's not like you don't hear her or you don't hear him, but because of your faulty perception, oh, they just friends. <laughs> oh, he's going to get a job one day. <laughs> it's going to be all right one day. Are you with me? And, and let me not go too far from the text because this is the problem they had with Jesus. He was saying the whole time who he was. He was saying the whole time what he would do. But because of what, remember when he said to Peter, um, who do people say that I am? And Peter says, you're the son of you're, you're Christ, the son of the living God. Here's what Jesus said. Flesh and blood had not revealed it. Yet and still, when Jesus got in the garden, he was the first one to draw a sword. He knew what he said, but he still had a faulty perception. And if we're not careful, faulty perceptions will draw us back to the graveyard. Are you with me? So listen, y'all, clean your glasses so you can see clearly. Repeat after me. Say, self, beware of faulty perception. Now, here's the most important thing I want you to hear me say this morning. Here's the third thing. The reason they kept going back to the graveyard is because they forgot what Jesus said he would do. And this is the good news I came to bring you this morning. They forgot what Jesus said he would do. Look at the text. Look with me. Look with me at verse. Back up to verse 6. It says here, the angel said, last part of 5, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he has risen. And then watch this. Remember how he told you while he was in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. And I love verse 8. Once they heard that, they did what? They remembered his what? Church, I came today to tell you stop living life in the graveyard by reminding you of Jesus' words. Oh, I wish I had somebody in here. I, I came long enough to remind you of Jesus' word because here is my reminder when I'm in that graveyard and sitting on mom's grave and I'm crying and I have to drive way across town to go to dad's grave and I sit on dad's grave and I cry. If I cry long enough, for some reason, my wife who is with me reminds me of God's word because here's what she says, you'll see him again. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'll see her again. And for some reason, something about those words dries the tears up. Come on. And, and it reminds me, you don't have unfinished business. Come on. You, 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 you know who God is and what God has says. And it gives me the strength and the encouragement to press on. The whole time, Jesus had been saying to these women, I am the resurrection and the life. 
He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. They had heard him say, you tear this temple down, I will rebuild it in three days. And they had forgotten everything about that because of their faulty perception. But when the angel reminded them, oh my goodness, they knew everything was going to be all right. Listen, church, it doesn't matter how long you've been in the graveyard this morning. It doesn't matter how many visits you've made. It doesn't matter how challenging it is to release the stains of the past and the struggle of the past. I stopped by long enough just to let you know that because Jesus lives, you can live. Come on. Because the grave couldn't hold him down, you can get up. He told me to come by and let you know that you're in front and not behind. Come on, you got to hear me. He loves you. He cares for you. And he can raise you up. So don't let dead sins, don't let strongholds, don't let the past, don't let things in your yesteryear on this resurrection morning plague you down. Because he lives, you can live. Come on, are you hearing me? songwriter said, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever man may say. I see his hands of mercy. Come on. I hear his voice of cheer. And whenever I need him, I know he's always near. Ask me how I know he lives. He lives within me and he can live in you today. Because he lives. Because he lives. You can live. Because he lives, you can live. Because he lives, you can live. I'm going to say it one more time. Because he lives, you can live. Lock into this. The enemy's job is to remind you of what happened in the graveyard. And if we let him remind us without the truth that God has already delivered us, We will go back looking for life in the graveyard. You don't have to be there. You don't have to be there. God can bring you out. So here's what I want to do this morning. Just like I had to have my own time in prayer on this resurrection morning, I want to pray with you. Because I know somebody here is saying, wow, Pastor, I hadn't thought of resurrection in that way. I thought it was just a cycle of life that I had to go through and I was stuck there because the pain is real. The resurrection is also real. You don't have to live there. God can set you free. As you stand to your feet this morning, here's what I want to do. If you're here and the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you and God is saying, don't leave here the rest this resurrection morning the same way you came, We want to pray. Give your heart to God. If you have not said yes to God, if you have not given your life to God, he can turn things around. So listen, if you're here this morning and you haven't said yes, I want to say to you now, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. On this resurrection morning, do not leave here the same way you came. If God is drawing you, come, come, come. We just want to connect with you. We just want to lay hands on you. We just want to pray with you. Or maybe even if you've been saying, man, I see myself currently in the graveyard. Jesus came to set us free from that. Come this morning. We want to pray wherever you find yourself this morning. Because he lives, you can live. Don't let the person sitting next to you stop you from coming. You come, you come. Come on, you come this morning. You come, come, you come. Come, wherever you are, you come. Whatever you're going through, you come. Come this morning, you come, come. If you're saying, man, is he talking to me? Yes, I'm talking to you, but it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit speaking to you, saying, come and get it right this morning. What an opportunity to allow God to be God. Come on, come, as the Spirit is moving. As the Spirit is moving, come. Or maybe you're just saying, I want to rededicate my life to God because I've strayed away or maybe I just haven't been all I should be. You come this morning. You come and allow God to be God. We want to pray with you. We want to connect with you. We want to minister to you. Get a fresh start. Allow God to speak. Come on, come. Amen. Come, come, come. 
Come on, we, if I got to wait, I'm going to wait because God is speaking this morning. You come, come. Amen. Come, come. Is there another that God is speaking to? Come this morning. Allow God to be God. My life is worth the living just because. <laughs> just because he lives. Yeah. Got a new walk, a new talk, a new everything because he lives. Holy Spirit, continue to move at this altar this morning. Move across this building, God. Do, God, do what you do best in this place, Lord, to draw people for a relationship with you as we give this to you, God. Be God in this place, Lord, in your name.